Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Upper Speeds live class. I can see nobody's in class yet, so I'll go ahead and get started, but I'm sure we'll have some students jump in maybe at a later time. So I will go ahead and mute everyone so that we don't get disrupted with that. So if you are with our trial uh, session this week, we welcome you to Platinum Steno. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email, email us. And uh, again, this is the uh, high speeds live class. So we focus on 180, 200, 225. And uh, typically a class um, is run uh, a little bit differently each class, but we try to keep the same um, order. So we start with, uh, we start with drills and uh, then we go into uh, jury charge, literary, and then Q&A. So, hi Donna, how are you? Hello, all right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I'll go ahead and mute everyone. And then I'll unmute everyone after class, all right? So let's get started. Common words, um, these all start with either P, W, and B, initial P, W, B, and then I'm going to go into words that start with initial H, R, and L, okay? All right, here we go. Back palm war, pal ball wet, wad belt pet, bat peg win, bill pot weld, break pry ring, bright wedge proof, pump, Bust wove, wade prude brute, bug prod weight, war pick bet, welt pass bald, part bar wart, pack bolt wave, wash black play, wind bid pill, watch plight bleak, brag pride wail, bike pest wild, one par bark, hope rope lope. Reap, leap, heap. Lent, hat, rent. Hack, race, leave. Read, life, hail. Hype, right, lie. Rug, hug, lug. Ho, lip, ram. Lab, hill, roll. Rock, late, how. Lead, red, head. Her, raid, loin. Hoop, rise, loop. Roam, home, loam. Line, ride, hide. Hem, lime, rat, ray, hook, light, huff, love, rough, huge, lodge, ridge, rack, leaf, half, rub, hit, lake, lick, rule, hick, lot, rot, hot, hid, lid, rid, lace, hair, rate. All right. My second drill is going to focus on final SH and final CH words. Okay, here we go. Mash, match, Nash, or I'm sorry, gash, touch, dash, bitch, stash, stitch, dish, ditch, push, peach, flash, leech, trash, peach, wish, witch, lash, latch, hash, hatch, bash, beach, hush, hutch. Slash, hitch, dush, gash, splash, splotch, blush, blotch, mush, notch, rush, reach, bash, batch, wash, watch, sash, such, clash, clutch, stash, stitch, posh, pitch, leash, botch, crash, crutch, rash, rich, fish, fetch, cash, catch. All right, I see you have a little friend there today. <laughs> I love it. It's got to make you feel good just to know you have your little, your little guy next to you. I love that. All right, now consonant compounds. I'm going to start with TWTR, FRFL, BLBR, ST, SK. Here we go. Uh, twin trot, tweed trip. Twain tree, twist trade, twice try, twerp true, twig trek, tweak tribe, 
tweet trial, twine train, twill trick, tweeze trap, free flap, fruit float, frame flight, frill fly, frog fluff, fret flag, fry flood, fright flea, freak flip, fraud fr flame, frock flit, frail flare, bless brick, blade broil, blow bruise, black broom, bluff braid, blight breed, bloat bribe, blab brave, blare brawn, bleed brain, block brim, bliss breeze, stop scar, step sky, still skid, stuff skull, stick score, stab scab, star skate, steam skill, stay scale, steer scoop, stone scour, state skin. All right. Medical doublets. <clears throat> Here we go. Ready? Alcohol prep, treatment table, adhesive tape, betadine swab, sponge count, triangle bandage, waterproof tape, poison antidote, sterile gauze, cervical traction, Penrose drain, bluish tinge, isolation gown, sodium chloride, tongue depressor, inflatable splint, bedside rails, ankle support, patellar reflex, medicine cups, latex gloves, whirlpool bath, subjective symptom, oblique incision, irrigation tray, calls fracture, ammonia inhalant, sodium chloride, plastic drape, infrared lamp, hand restraints, extensive hemorrhage, costal cartilage, urine specimen, finger splint, vein retractors, general anesthetic, neurological testing, Foley catheters, Kelly forceps, frozen section, ace bandage, suture scissors, mosquito forceps. <clears throat> All right, some serial numbers. Here we go. And also uh, license plate numbers as well. California R244366, A409118, Washington 16A4242, Georgia 73U9002, Florida 51J1450, Missouri 35Q937, Oklahoma 05L236, South Dakota S432134, <clears throat> Minnesota 76R971X, <clears throat> Delaware N596014, Georgia 10DL28, Montana R5038H, California T760293, C388451, 092407P, E261146, Michigan 59L8794, Hawaii 71744Q, Ohio E98M218, Virginia 31R0596, South Dakota J47Q91, Arkansas 98K0365, Rhode Island 76 a4249, Iowa 3964710, Montana 6090B7, Oregon 13A3694, Idaho E0159D, Texas D470422, Massachusetts 281026Q, 
Kansas, 841754G, Mississippi, 08B65, Kentucky, <clears throat> 19C3351, New Mexico, 310827K, Delaware, U981043, North Dakota, L927808, Colorado, 735629G, Alabama, 09V1916, Rhode Island, 86B1647. All right. <clears throat> Moving into our next drill. It's going to focus on with, were, when, where, whether, we. And I'm going to read off phrases before I start the sentences. Okay, here we go. With him, you were, when is, where will, whether you. With it, we were, when are, where can, whether the. With us, when were, when will, where do, whether we. With her, they were, when could, where were, whether they. With Joe, rags were, when were, where was, whether she. With Lee, some were, when were, when would, where is, whether he. We knew when, with time, where does, were you, when does. With care, when did, whether I, where did, whether it, whether some, we sang, we turned, were we, were they. Where were you? With the case, with a song, with the car, whether we go, when and where, whether we do, where are we, where and when, whether we do, whether we are. Were you with it? Tell us whether we could. When are we due? We were with him. How many were there? Were we thinking? I don't know whether I can. Get with it. Where were we? Where were you born? What were your plans? Go wherever you like. Ask whether we were to go. When is it due? Where were they put? If I were you, I'd go. When will we leave? We were with them. Tell me whether we should. Please ask him when. All right. This next drill focuses on way and way, like what way would you like to go? W long A, and then how much does the baby weigh? I like to flag that one, but I have heard of some people writing it as W long A G. So that's up to you. I just like to flag that one. How much do you weigh? And then we have weight, wait a minute, W long A T, as opposed to weight. Um, what is the weight of the fruit? That would be W long A G T. All right, so let me give you your phrases first. Weigh those, this way, it weighs. To weight, his weight, long weight, that way, weigh these, many ways, a weight her weight, weighing it, some way, weigh them, some ways, the weight, my weight, he weighed. And then obviously if you get the wrong weight, not a big deal, you just go in in the edit mode and fix it if it were a test. All right, here we go. The judge hates to wait. I'll wait until noon. He weighs too much. Show me a better way. We pay it by weight. It is the wrong way. Give the proper weight. The judge has waited. Weigh the evidence. Stop at a way station. <clears throat> way station. What is its, <clears throat> its weight? Some ways are good. Tie it down with weights. It was a long wait. Weigh both sides. I'm waiting for trial. She is overweight. Show us the way. I'm weighing his words. I waited until noon. What does it weigh? There are <clears throat> several ways. <coughs> Excuse me. His weight is down. Do it this way. Weigh the arguments. I just hate to wait. Wait for the signal. 
I'll get your weight. It weighs on his mind. There are two ways. Weigh it carefully. Try a different way. Wait for the verdict. Estimate the weight. I'm waiting for the jury. I'm doing it my way. <clears throat> I weighed his testimony. I am waiting for him. He'll weigh it today. It's the way to succeed. Use one ounce weights. He waits impatiently. It was weighted down. What way is right? He weighs each item. All right. My last drill is going to focus on shall, shush, shun. So they're all together. Shall, S-H-L, shush, S-H-S, and shun, final G-S. Okay, here are your words first. Fictitious, vicious, loquacious, judicious, nutritious, concussion, fashion, permission, beneficial, glacial, artificial, tradition, essential, flirtation, credential. <clears throat> A policy is essential. The effect is glacial. She isn't very social. It looks artificial. Fix the differential. I have my credentials. Use a rotation system. What is your initial? The home is spacious. Go in for your facial. The bear is ferocious. I'm going on vacation. It is a crucial time. My name is fictitious. I sign the petition. My appetite is voracious. Your friend is loquacious. Her furs are ostentatious. Her dress is atrocious. His reason was spe specious. They rely on irrigation. He did a superficial job. Vicious rumors are flying. The child was precocious. The rains were torrential. Serve nutritious meals. Attend the celebration. What time is the audition? The victim is unconscious. I felt the vibration. Avoid any duplication. I must fight inflation. The location is perfect. What is your vocation? It was a mass migration. The deletion or the delegation is here. He works at Prudential. The raise is unofficial. Are they suspicious? He prefers cremaceous, or excuse me, he prefers cremation. He has great potential. He hides his emotion. The tail is fall fallacious. What is the commotion? All right. <clears throat> Moving into literary. <clears throat> I've been taking an allergy pill at night when I go to bed, so it doesn't make me tired, and I forgot to last night, so now I can see it really helps to do that at night. All right. I've got a fun little news fact here that I'm going to use for literary warm-up. I'll read it at 180. It's called News Flush. It's kind of a funny, funny little uh, news fact. All right, here we go. Mount Tabor Reservoir provides the city of Portland, Oregon with a lot of its water, but it sits uncovered in the middle of a public park. What could possibly go wrong? In April 2014, the Portland Water Bureau dumped 38 million gallons of water from the reservoir after a 19-year-old was caught peeing into it. He was caught on camera whizzing right in front of a sign that read, this is your drinking water, don't spit, throw, or toss anything into it. <laughs> and then it says, Greenland can't compete in official international soccer. The reason? It's too cold to grow enough grass on the fields there. You would think they would just use artificial turf, but I don't know. Maybe they don't play soccer on that, although they do football. So what do they call soccer? Football. All right. This is kind of a mix between a literary and a, a number drill. It's, a, it's an actual um, 
um, recipe. So you're going to have like numbers for all the things that are in it. So I just thought, oh, this would be kind of fun, like a recipe slash, you know, literary. Okay. This is called Farmer's Quiche. <clears throat> Maybe you want to get out my quiche recipe and make it again. All right, here we go. Ready? And I'll read this at 180. On our farm, it always seemed there wasn't enough time in the day. My mom would make homemade quiche often because it was quick and used ingredients we had on hand. This quiche was beautiful in one of the vintage pie dishes she had collected over the years. Serves eight. One medium onion sliced, two tablespoons butter, two teaspoons of honey, two or three heirloom tomatoes sliced, one and a half cups of fresh spinach, four slices of cooked bacon chopped, three to four slices of honey ham chopped, one cup grated cheddar or pizza blend cheese, one cup whole milk, one cup heavy cream, five large eggs, salt and pepper to taste, one teaspoon of garlic powder, cornmeal crust, one and a half all-purpose flour, one and a half cups of yellow cornmeal, two and a half cups of lard, four tablespoons unsalted butter, or teaspoons, excuse me, cold, one teaspoon kosher salt, two teaspoons granulated sugar, five to six tablespoons of ice water. To make the cornmeal crust, place the flour, cornmeal, salt, and sugar into a bowl. Stir to combine. Cut in the lard and cold butter using a pastry cutter and two forks. Add the water a little at each time until the crust holds together when squeezed in your hand. Place the crust into a large zip style bag and refrigerate for one to two hours. To make the quiche, melt the butter in a saute pan over low to medium heat. Add the onion to the pan, stirring occasionally with a wooden spoon. Cook over low to medium heat for about 15 minutes. Add the honey and sprinkle with salt and pepper to taste. Once cooked, turn off the heat and set aside. Press the cornmeal crust into a 10 inch cast iron skillet with your hands. Gently poke holes into the bottom with a fork. Bake in a preheated 425 degree oven for 12 minutes. Let cool for 10 minutes. Place the spinach, bacon, ham, cheese, and caramelized onion into the cornmeal crust. Set aside. In a large bowl, combine the milk and the cream. Add the egg, salt, pepper, and garlic powder and beat well with a fork. Pour the mixture into the skillet. Gently place the heirloom tomato slices in a circular pattern on the top of the quiche. Place the quiche in a preheated 375 degree oven for about 60 minutes or until the eggs are set and the top is golden brown. Let cool for 15 to 20 minutes before slicing. Kind of makes me hungry. <laughs> All right. Now, before we go into jury charge, here it is. I have an article here on a farm girl's table. I got this from the same magazine. All right, here we go. Ready? And I will read this at... Um, I'll read this at 180, okay? Not everyone is fortunate enough to grow up on a farm, but everyone can cook as if they did. This 176-page cookbook was forged for anyone who has the spirit of farm-fresh cooking inside of them. It's for moms and dads who incorporate heirloom tomatoes into the flower garden and the home bakers who are always looking for the perfect baking pan to complete their collection. It's for the suburban farmer with an oversized plot of land she cultivates and the urbanite who simply grows a few tomatoes and a bit of basil on his back patio. Even if you're not blessed with a green thumb, these recipes will inspire you to seek out the freshest ingredients at the farmer's markets and vegetable stands. Entice your family and friends with the savory aromas of homemade French Canadian beef stew and homemade potato rolls or serve a special breakfast to or of easy to make farmer's quiche and spiced apple jam. Jessica Robinson, a New England farm girl transplanted to North Carolina, shares heartwarming stories and personal advice along with a bushel of new recipes in her much anticipated second cookbook, A Farmer's Table, Gibbs Smith, April 4, 2017. 
everything from using produce from the garden or farmer's market, stocking a pantry with canned goods, making homemade bread and traditional family recipes, entertaining guests at get-togethers with recipes for Yankee barbecue, berry swirled pops, blackberry raspberry lemonade, pasta salads, hearty main courses, handcrafted pies, lemon blueberry pound cake, and more. Beautifully detailed images captured by Jessica herself will make you want to reach on the page and bite into the homemade pastry she's created or sip on freshly brewed peach sweet tea. Another of the well-reviewed New England farm girl, Jessica was raised on a small Connecticut farm where her family raised livestock and grew crops, as well as operated a maple sugar house. Today, Jessica lives on a small farm in Graham, North Carolina with her husband and two sons. She is the editor, recipe developer, and photographer for her popular blog, Carolina Farmhouse Kitchen. You'll often find her in her country kitchen whipping up homemade jams, pickles, and confections from locally produced goods. All right. Moving into jury charge. This is one page. So what I'm going to do is read this once at 200, and then I'm going to read it again at 225. Okay. All right, here we go. Members of the jury, evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. It is direct evidence if it proves without an inference and which in itself, if true, conclusively establishes that fact. It is circumstantial evidence if it proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence as to the degree of proof required. Each is accepted as a reasonable method of proof and each is respected for such convincing forces as it may carry. The court may take judicial notice of certain facts or events. When the court declares it will take judicial notice of some fact or event, you may accept the court's declaration as evidence and regard as proved the fact or event which has been judicially noticed, but you are not required to do so since you are the sole judges of the facts. Okay, so I'm going to read that again at 225. Here we go. Members of the jury, evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. It is direct evidence if it proves without an inference and in which in itself, if true, conclusively establishes that fact. It is circumstantial evidence if it proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence as to the degree of proof required. Each is accepted as a reasonable method of proof, and each is respected for such convincing forces as it may carry. The court may take judicial notice of certain facts or events. When the court declares it will take judicial notice of some fact or event, you may accept the court's declaration as evidence and regard as proved the fact or event which has been judicially noticed, but you are not required to do so since you are the sole judges of the facts. All right. And I have one more that I'm going to do. Again, it's one page. <clears throat> You're going to hear um, insinuation. Um, let's see. There's really, I don't really see anything that stands out that I really need to tell you. Everything else is pretty standard. Okay, so I'll read this once at 200. Again, at 225. Here we go. Members of the jury, you must not consider as evidence any statement of counsel made during the trial. However, if counsel for the parties have stipulated to any fact or any fact has been admitted by counsel, you will regard that fact as being conclusively proved as to any question to which an objection was sustained. You must not speculate as to what the answer might have been or as to the reason for the objection. You must not consider for any purpose of any offer of evidence that was rejected or any evidence that was stricken out by the court. Such matter is to be treated as though you had never known of it. You must never speculate to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked of a witness. A question is not evidence and may not be considered only as 
or may be considered only as it supplied meaning to the answer. Certain testimony has been read into evidence from depositions. A deposition is testimony taken under oath before the trial and preserved in writing. You are to consider that testimony as if it had been given in court. Okay, and then my last time at 225. Here we go. Members of the jury, you must not consider as evidence any statement of counsel made during the trial. However, if counsel for the parties have stipulated to any fact or any fact has been given or admitted by counsel, you will regard that fact as being conclusively proved as to any question to which an objection was sustained. You must not speculate as to what the answer might have been or as to the reason for the objection. You must not consider any purpose, any offer of evidence that was rejected or any evidence that was stricken out by the court. Such matter is to be treated as though you had never known of it. You must never speculate to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked of a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as supplied, meaning to the answer. Certain testimony has been read into the evidence from depositions. A deposition is testimony taken under oath before the trial and preserved in writing. You are to consider that testimony as if it, if it had been given in court. All right, I'm going to read that one more time because I felt like I kind of stumbled on some of my words. So it wasn't, most of it was at 225, but a couple times it was at 200 because um, I didn't meet the marks. Let me just do it one more time, okay? Here we go. Members of the jury, you must not consider as evidence any statement or counsel made during the trial. However, if the counsel for the parties have stipulated to any fact or any fact has been admitted by counsel, you will regard that fact as being conclusively proved. As to any question to which an objection was sustained, you must not speculate as to what the answer might have been or as to the reason for the objection. You must not consider for any purpose any offer of evidence that was rejected or any evidence that was stricken out by the court. Such matter is to be treated as though you had never known of it. You must never speculate to be true any insinuation suggested by a question asked of a witness. A question is not evidence and may be considered only as it's supplied, meaning to the answer. Certain testimony has been read into evidence from depositions. A deposition is testimony taken under oath before the trial and preserved in writing. You are to consider that testimony as if it had been given in court. All right, now that was 225 the whole way through. All right, last one. This is on canons of judicial ethics. And this is the preamble. And I'm just going to, I'm going to read this at 180 because it is a little bit more challenging. Okay. All right. So you're going to hear a judiciary. Um, let's see. Impropriety. Constitutional. Public interest. Assumption, inhabitants, uh, practitioners, uh, let's see, canons, administration, uh, canons for professional conduct of lawyers, American Bar Association, ethical, Unconsciously, United States, Federal Constitution. Um, I think that's about it. All right. Litigants. All right. I'll read this at 180. Here we go. In addition to the canons for professional conduct of lawyers, which it has formulated and adopted, the American Bar Association, mindful that the character and conduct of a judge should never be objects of indifference and that declared ethical standards tend to become habits of life, deems it desirable to set forth in its views respecting those principles which should govern the personal practice of members of the judiciary in the administration of their office. The association accordingly adopts the following canons, the spirit of which it suggests as a proper guide and reminder for judges and as indicating what the people have a right to expect from them. Number one, relations of the judiciary. The assumption of the offices of judge casts upon the incumbent 
duties in respect to his personal conduct, which concern his relation to the state and its inhabitants, the litigants before him, the principles of law, the practitioners of law in his court, and the witnesses, jurors, and attendants who aid him in the administration of its functions. Number two, the public interest. Courts exist to promote justice and thus to serve the public interest. Their administration should be speedy and careful. Every judge should be all times or excuse me, should at all times be alert in his rulings and in the conduct of the business of the court so far as he can to make it useful to litigants and to the community. He should avoid unconsciously falling into the attitude of mind that the litigants are made for the courts instead of the courts for the litigants. Number three, constitutional obligations. It is the duty of all judges in the United States to support the federal constitution and that of the state whose laws they administer. In so doing, they should fearlessly observe and apply fundamental limitations and guarantees. Number four, avoidance of impropriety. A judge's official conduct should be free from impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. He should avoid infractions of the law and his personal behavior, not only upon the bench and in the performance of judicial duties, but also in his everyday life should be beyond reproach. <clears throat> All right, we'll go into Q&A. Now I have a one page Q&A that I want to give you. I'm going to read this once at 180, then again at 200, then again at 225. Um, because it is one page. So it's perfect. Let me give you a word list. You're going to hear cereal, liquor, vicinity, description, chalk. That's about it. All right. And this is going to be a defense questioning, strictly Q&A from defense. Okay, first time will be at 180. Here we go. What did you find? In the garage, I found some cases of liquor and a collector truck that I remembered as having been taken on June the 25th. These cases of liquor that you found, were they opened or unopened or both? Both. All right, and the particular collector truck you found in the garage, what color was that? As I recall it, it was a red one. It came off of the... Shall I tell the incident where it came off? Well, no, right now just tell us the color. I believe it was red, as I recall it. And can you recall if it had like a number or serial number or a model number on it? It actually had two numbers on it. One was welded on the, and one was just written on with chalk or some such thing. Could you state now what those numbers were? No, I can't. Did you put it in your report? Yes, it would be in the report, I'm sure. Did you search the area for any particular automobile in the vicinity? Yes, I did. Can you describe the particular automobile? I had a description of two or three that I was looking for. You had been given descriptions of two or three automobiles? Yes, sir, that is correct. So this case was from a uh, I guess a bust, they went into like, it reminded me of the American Pickers. They went into like a big garage and uh, found a bunch of stolen items that had been stolen years ago. And so there were like collector items and old cars, things like that. So that's why they're talking about collectors and what they found in there. All right, so let's do it again at 200. Here we go. What did you find? In the garage, I found some cases of liquor and a collector truck that I remembered as having been taken on June the 25th. These cases of liquor that you found, were they opened or unopened or both? Both. All right, and the particular collector truck you found in the garage, what color was that? As I recall it, it was a red one. It came off of the, shall I tell the incident where it came off? Well, no, right now just tell us the color. I believe it was red as I recall it. And can you recall if it had like a number or a serial number or a model number on it? It actually had two numbers on it. One was welded on and one was just written on with chalk or some such thing. Could you state now what those numbers were? No, I can't. Did you put it in your report? Yes, it would be in the report, I'm sure. 
Did you search the area for any particular automobile in the vicinity? Yes, I did. Can you describe the particular automobile? I had a description of two or three that I was looking for. And you had been given descriptions of two or three automobiles? Yes, sir, that is correct. All right, last time at 225. I can even go up to 250 after this because it seems like it's pretty easy to read. All right, here we go, ready? What did you find? In the garage, I found some cases of liquor and a collector truck that I remembered as having been taken on June the 25th. These cases of liquor that you found, were they opened or unopened or both? Both. All right, and the particular collector truck you found in the garage, what color was that? As I recall it, it was a red one. It came off of the, shall I tell the incident where it came off? Well, no, right now just tell us the color. I believe it was red as I recall it. And can you recall if it had like a number or a serial number or a model number on it? It actually had two numbers on it. One was welded on and one was just written on with chalk or some such thing. Could you state now what those numbers were? No, I can't. Did you put it in your report? Yes, it would be in the report, I'm sure. Did you search the area for any particular automobile in the vicinity? Yes, I did. Can you describe the particular automobile? I had a description of two or three that I was looking for. You had been given descriptions of two or three automobiles? Yes, sir, that is correct. Okay, now I can read that one last time at 150, if you like. Give you a little push. Okay, here we go. What did you find? In the garage, I found some cases of liquor in a collector truck that I remembered as having been taken on June the 25th. These cases of liquor that you found, were they opened or unopened or both? Both. All right, and the particular collector truck you found in the garage, what color was that? As I recall it, it was a red one. It came off of the, shall I tell the incident where it came off? Well, no, right now just tell us the color. I believe it was red as I recall it. And can you recall if it had like a number or a serial number or a model number on it? It actually had two numbers on it. One was welded on and one was just written on with chalk or some such thing. Could you state now what those numbers were? No, I can't. Did you put it in your report? Yes, it would be in the report, I'm sure. Did you search the area for any particular automobile in the vicinity? Yes, I did. Can you describe that particular automobile? It had a description of two or three that I was looking for. You had been given descriptions of two or three automobiles? Yes, sir, that is correct. All right. Now, my next uh, q and A. I'm going to start at 200, okay, right off the bat, and then I'll work my way to 225. So it's, this one's two pages, so I'll spend one page at 200 and the second page <clears throat> at 225. Okay. All right. This is going to be plaintiff questioning. All right, how are we doing on time? Here we go, ready? At the time of your deposition, I believe you said that you had testified in two cases prior to that time as an expert, is that correct? That is correct. And is that also correct today? In terms of the testimony in court, that is correct. One of those was testimony about an oil well rig involving some mechanical failure, that is correct. And the other was a plumbing situation, a missile launcher, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's correct at the time of your deposition, you had had experience at that time or were working on three automobile cases, is that correct? I believe that is correct. How many of those involved single car accidents? None involved single car accidents. One involved an auto pedestrian accident. Were you asked to reconstruct the accident? Yes, I was. I believe you said one defense firm had called you in relation to a bus accident. That is correct. You had done no work on it. No, the case hadn't started yet as far as I was concerned. Doctor, prior to April, had you ever conducted any accident reconstruction tests? Not with respect to automobiles. Your work has been primarily limited to aircraft, aircraft and spacecraft and the associate technologies. When your deposition was taken, had you looked at a couple of recordings that were made at the university in relation to the car accident reconstruction? At that time, it was not me. It was not to prepare me to testify in court here. All right, since March 7, when your deposition was taken, how many hours have you put in on this case? I can't give you an exact number. I don't have my timesheets with me. It must be on the order of 100. You have billed for that time. We have billed for everything up until April. I don't think we sent a bill since then. At the time of your deposition, 
you had put in about 90 hours. Is that correct? That could be. You know better than I do. No further questions. Doctor, insofar as this case is concerned, when you were first called in on it, I believe the last week in January was the first time I heard of the case. At that time, were you furnished a copy of Mr. Carter's report? I was furnished many documents. That was one of them. And were you furnished pictures at that time that Mr. Carter had taken? Yes, I was. Okay, were you furnished the parts that you have here in court? I was furnished several of those parts that we have in court. I don't know whether I was furnished all of them. Were you furnished the wheel and tire? I did not see those until they were here in court. I think I saw them for a couple of minutes a couple of weeks ago before they were here in court. Insofar as the parts that you were furnished at that time, can you tell me the parts you were given? Yes, I was given the power steering pump bracket. Did you ever see any spacer that was mounted with a bracket? No. What part of the automobile received the major impact of the damage? All I know is what I have seen in these pictures. Where do you determine that to be? Just casually looking at the pictures, there appears to be major damage on the right. The entire front appears to be damaged. Was the frame pushed to the right in the front end? I don't know how I could tell that by looking at those pictures. The camera was at a, such a funny angle, and I can't see that very well. <clears throat> All right, moving into complete four voice. The court does jump into this one. Let me give you a word list. Okay, you're going to hear patrolman, Pennsylvania, stock exchange. Um, let's see. What else? Actually, you know what? I I did read this one. I just I didn't. Uh, I recognize this one. I don't want to read this one again. I'm sorry. Let me go to the next one that I have for you guys. I always pull extra just in case, okay? Yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't uh, date that one. Okay. So this one, you're going to hear West Ohio Administrative Abridge Relevant uh, Vordier or Vordier. You hear it both ways. Unmass meaning together as a group, hostage, militant, narrative, speech, issuance, Oliver, um, university, campus, bard, reframe, and that's about it. So this one's going to start with plaintiff, but court does come in and uh, defense comes in and uh, questions on Vordier. Or a voir dire, depending on kind of like tomato, tomato. Okay, let me date this because I don't. Sometimes if I don't date it, then after class, I'm like, oh, what did I read? All right, here we go. And just so you know, you're going to hear um, direct your attention, which is uh, D U R T. You don't know that yet. All right, here we go, ready? I'm gonna start at 200, work my way to 225. Mr. Oliver, I will direct your attention to the dates of May 7, 8, and 9. What was your employment or occupation? I was an administrator at the West Ohio State University. What was your particular administrative position, president of the university, and did you on the morning of May 9, 2010. May I approach the witness, please? Yes, you may. Did you cause what I am showing you, people's number eight, this order to be issued? Yes, I did. What occurred prior to this date which had any bearing upon your issuance of this order? Objection, Your Honor, there is no foundation showing that there was any authority whatsoever for the issuance of this order. <clears throat> may I take the witness on, Vordier? Yes, you may, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Oliver, you testified that you were president of the university on the 7th, 8th, and 9th of May? Yes, that is correct. Did you hold any other position prior to being president at West Ohio State University? I was vice president of the university, this branch of the Ohio University system. Yes, did you hold any position with the state or federal governments other than your association with the state university system? No. 
on May 9. Were you aware of any statute giving you the authority to abridge free speech on the campus? Objection, Your Honor. This calls for a conclusion. I don't think this is relevant. Sustained. I have no further questions on voir dire, Your Honor. I renew my objection to the introduction of any evidence through this witness. Overruled. Subject to a motion to strike if it isn't all tied up. I wish to renew my objection to the question before this witness as to what he based his order on as far as prior events. It's not specifically just calling for a long narrative answer, but I would prefer your question. I will sustain the objection. Reframe your question, if you will, please, counsel. Thank you. Dr. Oliver, did anything occur prior to the state which may, which had any bearing upon the issuance of this order? Objection, Your Honor. The question is too vague. He can be more specific. It is indefinite. Reframe your question. Did anything occur on January 4, 2010 that had any bearing upon your issuance of this order? Objection. And I move to strike the answer. January 4, by its very date, is too far removed to justify an order made in May. If they had dropped a nuclear bomb on this date, it doesn't justify suppressing free speech. I wouldn't say the very date is too far removed. If no relevancy can be shown, that is one thing. But if it is relevant, that is something else. But how can the court tell whether it is relevant or not until I have heard what it is? I don't think at this point the question is whether free speech was suppressed in January. And secondly, I don't know anything about the relevancy of a nuclear bomb being dropped in this particular case. Let's see what we can hear. And if it isn't tied up, it will be stricken. Okay, what occurred January 4, doctor, which had any bearing upon the issuance of this May 9 order? January 4, yes. A number of militant students went unmasked to an admissions and recordings building. To clarify this point even further, what did you see or hear, Dr. Oliver, which occurred on January 4, which had bearing upon your issuance of the May 9 order? On January 4, I saw a group of militant students on the fifth floor of the admissions and records building with the door barred and fire hoses out, refusing to allow me or any other officials of the college entrance. Okay, go ahead. I was later admitted and in my office, I was forced to sign an order for 12 demands which they dictated to me. On that day, I saw the halls of the fifth floor lined with militant students. I saw students standing guard at doors of rooms through open doors in which I observed a number of female employees being held hostage. Was there anything else that you heard or saw that day? I saw a number of other students blocking stairways down below. I saw several hundred students milling around in front of the building in a mob scene, mob action, shouting and yelling. Was there anything else on that particular day? Not that I can recall specifically. Was there anything on that date that you were told that had occurred on that date which had any bearing upon your issuance of the May 9 order? Yes. Objection. That calls for hearsay, Your Honor. Again, may I note my objection for the record that anything that Dr. Oliver learned of the events that took place in January are too far remote in time and place to be used on a basis for this. All right. How are we doing on time? Good. We have time for one more. <clears throat> We're almost done with this one, so we may even finish it up. I'm going to read this at 225, okay? This is defense, but it's going to go back to plaintiff in just a minute. Here we go. When you observed the block wall fence that had fallen off, was it on your side of the fence or on the other side of the fence, or do you remember? You mean after the accident? After the accident. There was a brick on my side, yes. There was a brick on your side, yes. Was it like one of the pieces here? Correct. Looks similar to the one that's shown there? Correct. And it was on the far end next to the wood fence there? It wasn't right next to it, no. It was probably the second one, I don't know. I'm unsure how this thing fell. So we'll say it was six to eight feet from this front side fence. And was there any partitions between this fence area there or any partitions? Is there any partitions in this area there? Partitions in what? I don't understand what you're saying. Well, in this area alongside your fence, is there any boards between these here? In between the openings, you mean? 
Right. No. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Gailey, you're indicating that the bottom laser photocopy of plaintiff's three to your deposition is taken from your neighbor's side. That's correct. And you were present when this photograph was taken. I was at home when the person came to take the pictures. Yes. I did not follow her around to watch what she took. Can I look at the picture? Sure. Do you recall the next day when you observed this extension block? Was it all three blocks? Yes, I believe it was. It was either two or three. I'm not sure exactly. I would say two to three. And was it, and it was on your side, it was in your yard, correct? On the side of my house, yes, there is one. There was one. Do you know whatever happened to that block? Since then, you mean? Yes. No, not really. Did the person that came to take the photographs ever take custody of it? No, they're pretty heavy. It was a lady, and I'm not sure she could have lifted it. She had heels on. They're pretty heavy. It was a lady. It remained in its location where you found it the next day? I believe it did. I can't really remember for sure, but I remember I made sure that it was flat on the ground so, you know, it wouldn't be tilted up, maybe fall on my dog or some other kid or something like that. Or I may have put it on a skateboard or something and removed it, but I don't recall exactly, but one of the two. The interrogatory responses indicate you're not claiming damage to the concrete wall, are you? What do you mean? Trying to get money for damage? What are you saying? Well, the response indicates that it was going to be appraised. Was it ever appraised? I believe just in some paperwork it said something about that. No, I'm not looking for any money for anything. No, I don't even live in this house anymore. I think the response was just to document whether anything was damaged and we've just indicated yes there was damage to the wall because my homeowner's insurance I'm sure if I were to still be living there of course I would still want it fixed you never had it fixed during the time you lived there after it fell down right no I didn't have it fixed like I said I just checked the other uprights to see if you know any were loose or a potential danger were any of them loose I believe I was able to break one of them or two of them off. Yes, I gave it a lot of force because I wanted to be sure. So I really got on it and pulled on it. And if it was loose at all, I jarred it back and forth until I could finally break it off. You used to store what? Your motorhome or I'm sorry, your motorcycle or your quad in this area? Yes, it was a quad. It was right up against the fence there. Yes, where Daniel was crawling. Yes, well, when I saw him crawling, he was not at the very front part anymore. He was going towards the back of the house already, half the distance of the distance where you were standing. Yes, half the distance down here. And did he tell you what he had fallen on? Well, I don't know. Objection hearsay. No, he didn't say. Do you know how he fell, how he landed? Objection hearsay. No, I could not know that. All I saw were the injuries that occurred. Do you know if he fell on the ground or on the motorhome or, I'm sorry, on the quad? Objection hearsay. I don't believe so. Lack of foundation. It was right by the front, by the position where he was. And even though where I saw the brick and next to him, like I'd say six or eight feet. And in the quad area where my quad sits, you know, it's two to three feet from that. See, it was up on its back wheels up against the wall at an angle. Right. And the front wheel is up almost on the fence. Right. Five, six feet high. Yes. And the extension that you observed on the ground was approximately six or eight feet in front of the fence? Correct. And did you ever observe any cracks in the concrete between the wall and the fence? Well, I've never noticed them, no. Did you ever look for them? No, not prior to this accident, at least. And is it your testimony that there was an extension here at the very end that's depicted here at the top of the photograph of plaintiff's three? I couldn't tell you positively, but I believe there was because there's on the opposite side of the wall, there is one on the front part, so I believe there was. And then the block extension that you observed on the ground would have been the very next one in line on the eight to six foot opening. Probably, did you tear the front extension down after this incident? Did you take it down by the photograph by the time this photograph was taken? I'm really not positive which ones I pulled down after that. In August of 2013, I checked all of that, yes. So as we sit here today, you don't have any recollection either way, whether or not. I don't know if I pulled that front one down or not. Otherwise, I would know if it was there, but I'm not so positive. Do you have any information as to how this extension got onto the other side, onto your neighbor's side? No, I don't. Did your neighbors ever tell you that the block ever fell over? Uh-uh. Objection hearsay. What was your answer? No. Did your neighbors ever pull the blocks off these extensions? Not to my knowledge, no. 
I have nothing further, nothing here. Well, just one more question. Your indication is that the block is on the neighbor's side. That's just based upon the general of some shrubbery there on the ground, and you really don't know. That is your guess? No, it's not a guess. You're sure of that? Yes, absolutely sure that the photograph is not in the wrong, taken on the wrong side of the property or on your property. 99% sure. 99% sure that the photograph was not taken from your side of the fence? That's correct. Offer the following stipulation. The court reporter be relieved of her statutory duties under the Code of Civil Procedure to the extent that she can be, that the original transcript of Mr. Gailey's deposition be forwarded to Ms. Powell for her custody and safekeeping. He can read, review, and sign the deposition under declaration of penalty of perjury that we be notified of his signing changes and corrections if there is any within 45 days of the receipt by counsel. If we're not so notified, then the original shall be deemed signed. If the original is lost or otherwise unavailable, then a certified copy must be used in lieu of the original as if it were signed original in any subsequent hearing or proceeding in this matter. Is that okay? So stipulated, so stipulated. Let the record reflect also that I've given to both counsel copies of defendant Stephen Gailey's interrogatory answers. They will also be mailed. I just got a fax verification signed by the defendant on March 30th. Thank you. I would like a copy in addition to this. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, how is that? Fast. Yeah. <laughs> It seemed fast. Then when I was reading it, I can always kind of gauge when I'm reading how, you know, like what the material, the density of the material is for you guys. Yes. I, yeah, just by reading it. If it's hard for me to get to 225, I know it's probably dense for you guys. Not that it's it was good. It was yeah, good. not that the words were, were really difficult, but it just seemed like, um, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but... Yeah, it's pretty messy, but I think if I if I go back, I could read it. Yeah, at least a lot of it. Yeah. Well, and how did you do with the two voice? Um, I think that was okay. Good. I'm used to the two voice, not the four voice. Okay, you're used to two voice, not the four voice. I'm okay. in Texas, so yeah. Okay. Oh, hi. How, How are you? Is it, we're doing good here. <laughs> Great. Ida, right? Ida? Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi, Ida. Well, welcome. It's great to have you. Thank you. So do you know how to, do you know how to do the sign changes? Like how to sign in like the court and defense attorney and all of that? Well, I was just doing court, court, deaf, deaf, you know, just to get uh, a clarification of who is speaking. But no, I don't have like a set. Okay, so let me just give you a little rundown just and it's totally up to you. I think people there's you know, there's a couple different ways you can do it. But um, basically looking at this, you know, the keys here for court, I, I signed the court in as um, S T P H A O E U F P L T. So the whole top bank um, and all of the vowels. So I just leave these alone. I don't, I don't strike. Okay. Anything. Yeah, so I do the court as as you know, and a lot of the software is already programmed, I think, for that to be, you know, the cord. I think if you were, if you have software, it'd probably show up as the cord. Um, it used to be um, that if it was colloquy, you used to have to do witness, witness. Um, yeah. But now that we have software, the software is, it is so smart that it knows when it's colloquy. So if you, if you strike just the, the answer bank, which is uh -huh. LGTS, it will re recognize if the if if the witness is giving an, an answer or talking to like the court or the other attorney. So it it, it kind of recognizes that, which is really yeah. nice. So then I only now I just use F or P B L G T S. I don't even worry about witness witness anymore. And then um, the plaintiff attorney is Snoo S T P H A O. So I always sign him in if he's questioning. But then, of course, the question bank is just S T K P R H W. Um, that's the question. So once I sign in my attorney, if it's plaintiff, then I just go question, answer, question, answer. Now, if uh, defense is questioning, I label him as I F P L T, if Mr. If Pelt. Um, and then again, I sign him in. And then if it's just question and answer, it's back to the question bank, answer bank, even, you know. 
and this is okay. mine. Now, if for some reason you have two plaintiff attorneys, I, I use plaintiff two as Mr. Sprue, S-K-W-R-A-O, and then if there's two defense attorneys, I would use uh, Mr. Erbs, I-R-B-G-S, I do the short I. Um, so, and then if, if I had, you know, if I had more than, you know, I, that, I, that happened, you know, where I would have more than two defense attorneys, I really didn't see two plaintiffs a lot, two plaintiff attorneys a lot, but definitely more than two defense. And I have to just make up something like whatever it might be, if he had a funny tie or, you know, whatever it may be, yeah. or, or if she, you know, whatever stood out, I just made up something. But for, for the most part, at least, you know, for the light board, you can, you can do defenses if pelt and then snoo is your plaintiff and then if there's it obviously if there's colloquy then i would just hit snoo if if plaintiff came in and then the court and then if defense is talking to the court i hit if pelt so that's kind of donna is that kind of how you do it as well yeah the only difference for me is my court is just um both banks left and right and no vowels so you just do, you do all of these here? Yep, that's my court. Okay, and then you just leave out the vowels. See, there's, there, I knew there was a couple different ways. Yeah. Um, so well, yeah, there you go. Know. So Ida, you have a choice there, you know, you can, you can do, uh, you know, you can do like Donna does um, with just the banks here, leaving out the vowels, or you could do the top bank and the vowels and leave out the bottom, whatever. You know, whatever you, or the way you're doing it, just, um, you know, striking it twice, whatever you want to do. And I would just say whatever you like, stick with that so that you don't get, um, you don't pause, you know, to stop and think, oh, how do I want to do this? I would just pick away and go with it. So do you, do you have any questions about the, the light board and like any scenarios or I would just say this. The number one important thing to remember is, let's say plaintiff is questioning, right? And he gets uh, interrupted. Let's say defense comes in and just maybe has a question like, well, where were you born? Um, obviously, you have to sign him in as if held to show that defense came in. Otherwise, it, a miss sign change or a, a misidentified sign change, I know you're shaking your head yes, Donna, is minus five at, at the state test. Mm -hmm five adds up a lot. So, if you, you know, so you really want to make sure you get that, you know, you're staring at the light board so you don't miss a sign change and then, you know, identify him. But then once it goes back to plaintiff, you got to sign him in again. So, you know, plaintiff came back in um, or if, you know, whoever you, you know, if the court comes in, you got to make sure and get that sign change because that's minus five. If you, if you overlook that sign change. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, if you guys think of any other questions, let me know. Thank you. That uh, quiche uh, recipe sounded really good. <laughs> I know. I think I'm going to try it. I have my own quiche recipe, but I was looking at that going, man, that, <laughs> that seemed really good. And I don't know if it's just because I'm hungry, but I know we, we should all try it and see, uh, make it and see what we think. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Bye. Okay, bye. bye.